Amen. Amen. Thank you, worship team. Yes. Amen. Let's give God the glory this morning. He deserves all our praise today. We're just so thankful for you guys leading us to the throne this morning. Uh, so good to see everybody here today. Um, if you're new or uh, joining us online and you're new, uh, my name is Jason. I'm usually one of the worship leaders up here. Um, but Pastor Matt is enjoying some time with his family this weekend, so he asked me uh, to speak uh, this morning. Uh, so I hope you are all are enjoying some of this awesome weather that we've been having. I don't know if you remember the past few years, it's been like, it was like winter and then summer, right? And we're actually, it feels like we're actually getting a good spring this year, you know, which is very not normal for us. I mean, personally, I'm ready for 95 and humid. I know I'm weird. Like, it's cold in here to me right now. And, uh, you know, Pastor Matt usually has his fans in this whirlwind. I don't have any fans on this morning or anything. But it's been great. Um, and, uh, you know, my wife and I, uh, uh, Courtney, we've been able to get outside and uh, turn to come to find out we have taken up a new hobby. We have taken up pickleball. So we've entered a new era or a new age bracket. <laughs> You know, but it, I, I will say this, we, both courts that we've been to, there were teenagers out there playing, right? It's not just, they're, they're probably homeschooled, but there were at least some teenagers, you know, to do things a little different, and I can say that because my kids were homeschooled as well. But, you know, we got out there, and there's really nothing like trying something new to make you a little humble, right? It's especially something that's athletic or something a little active, you know. So you're, you know, I'm walking out there, I'm thinking, you know, when I was, I used to hit the tennis ball around a little bit, you know, nothing like, I didn't really play, but I'd hit it around, I, you know, I'll be fine, and you got there on this little shrunken tennis court, and you got this whiff, and you're hitting the wiffle ball back and forth, and you got this ping pong paddle on steroids, and you're hitting it back, and you're like, well, I'm out of breath, <laughs> you know, so I hold on a second, wait, wait just a second, you know, and she hits it anyway, well, I said, wait a second, you know. And it's, it's very humbling to be out there. Um, but, you know, there are some people, they are really serious about their pickleball. Man, they, uh, they, they're on next level. They're taking their $200, I'm serious, $200 paddles out, out of their cover, you know, and it's, it's shining. Whoa, you know, it's just awesome. And you can tell they mean business, right? You know you're serious about pickleball when you go out there with your strap on, your blowers and dry off the court. We're not going to let anything stop us today, right? Or they're wearing shirts like this, you know? If you're looking for a soft serve, go get ice cream, <laughs> right? It's like, I'm not going to be easy on you, man. And they're in it, and they are confident. They are ready. Now, there's nothing wrong with having some confidence. We all need a little confidence, right? I mean, could you imagine... You're going out, you're going to build a house, and you go to the contractor, and you're like, hey, you know, um, thinking about building a house, here are our plans, and they're not like lavish plans or anything, like, it's just a nice, simple house, and he starts scratching his head, and he's like, man, I don't know, you know, I'm not sure about this, I guess we can try, you're going to run, you're like, no, maybe not, <laughs> maybe you're not the contractor for us, maybe we need to find something else, you know, to build our house. And you need a certain level of confidence. I need a certain level of confidence when I'm up here and I'm playing guitar and singing and leading worship. But what I don't need and what the people around me don't need is a pompous or smug attitude. And I want to just give a shout out to our worship team this morning. Every person that you see, I mean, I'm with them every Sunday the last nine years. And then every person you see up here, they are, they are a humble servant. Of their talents. They really are. They are just some of the best people I've ever worked with. And I can say that because Thomas is not here this morning, our bass player. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> and I hope he's watching because we give him such a hard time all the time. But we love him. We love Thomas. He's just great. But we pray together. We definitely laugh together for sure. If you're ever sitting in here during one of our um, rehearsals, I mean, sometimes it's just hard for us to get through a song and we start laughing about something. So, But they are great. Every single person you see on this platform on Sunday morning, they are in it for the right reasons, and it's to glorify God and not themselves. So I'm just very, very happy to be with these group of people every Sunday. But the truth is... Oh, thank you very much. 
Uh, <laughs> I paid her to say that. Anyway, but, <laughs> but the truth is, humility is a virtue that is often misunderstood and undervalued in our society. We live in a world that celebrates self-promotion, where success is often measured by how much we can accumulate or achieve. Yet Jesus presents a radically different perspective. He teaches that true greatness is found not in being served, but in serving others. Not in exalting ourselves, but humbling ourselves. Christian writer Andrew Murray once said this. He said, pride must die in you or nothing of heaven can live in you. And that is a powerful statement. It underlines the importance of humility in our walk with Christ. So let's open up our Bibles. We're going to be in uh, Matthew in chapter 23, verses 1 through 12. And this is where the importance of humility is echoed by Jesus himself. If you're following along in your digital Bible, Bible app, um, I'll be reading from the CSB translation today. And I'd like to take this time uh, to welcome our uh, people watching online. Good to have you this morning. Before we get started um, reading scripture, let's pray together. Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for the truth of your word and the teachings of your son, Jesus, Lord. We ask for open hearts and that you open our minds today as we explore the power of humility. And God, help us fully grasp the importance of living a life of humility and give us the strength to apply it in our everyday lives. Lord, we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Matthew chapter 23. Then Jesus spoke to the crowds and to his disciples. The scribes and the Pharisees are seated in the chair of Moses. Therefore, do whatever they tell you and observe it. But don't do what they do, because they don't practice what they teach. They tie up heavy loads that are hard to carry and put them on other peop on people's shoulders, but they themselves aren't willing to lift a finger to move them. They do everything to be seen by others. They enlarge the phylacteries, which is like a little small leather box that they wear containing the Hebrew text. So they make them, you know, they have the, the big ones that show them off. And they lengthen their tassels. They love the place of honor at banquets, the front seats in the synagogues, greetings in the marketplace, and to be called rabbi. But you are not to be called rabbi because you have one teacher and you are all brothers and sisters. Do not call anyone on earth your father because you have one father who is in heaven. And you are not to be called instructors either because you have one instructor, the Messiah. Now we're going to stop here for just a second because it's like, well, we're not supposed to call anybody father. What, what is going on here? So here Jesus is probably speaking primarily to his disciples, just as later he addresses the Pharisees directly. So unlike the religious, author uh, so unlike the religious authorities, Jesus' disciples are not to be called rabbi because they have Jesus there with them. And here also Jesus is rejecting the authority of the religious teachers of his day. And then he's also saying, look, you know, among you, you're supposed to be, have this brotherly relationship. And then when we see the word father here in verse 9, the term uh, the fathers, it was actually a common way of referring to earlier teachers of the law. So that is why Jesus is saying you should only have one father, and the father is God himself. So moving on to verse 11, the greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. So let's dive in. Let's talk about humility. We're going to talk about why it matters, what Jesus had to say about it, and how we can live it out in our lives. And first, we're going to talk about the power of humility. Humility has power. And so the power of humility, it has the ability to transform our relationship with God. When we humble ourselves, we acknowledge our dependence on God. We recognize that every good thing we have, it comes from him, and we give him the glory that is rightfully his. And that's how we're supposed to approach the word to the Bible. We're supposed to approach it with humility. Instead of interpreting the scriptures so that they agree with what we believe, we should be approaching them 
And we line up our beliefs with what the scriptures say. So we come to it with humility. This posture of humility draws us closer to God. So as James 4, 8 said, promises is draw near to God and he will what? He will draw near to you. Secondly, the power of humility changes the way we relate to others. It moves us to consider others better than ourselves, to look not only to our own interests, but also to the interests of others. Philippians chapter 2, verses 3 through 4 says this, Do nothing out of selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look not to his own interest, but rather to the interest of others. This kind of humility fosters unity and love in our relationships as we seek to serve rather than to be served. And Jesus modeled this humility. He modeled it perfectly. I mean, listen, think about it. Despite being God himself, he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant. His astonishing humility and service to others were not, contaminate, um, were not contaminated by servility, meaning he was never over the top or just trying to be more humble than somebody else, the person next to him. His service and humility is genuine. It's genuine. It's just who he is. And it was perfectly compatible with exercising the highest authority. He humbled himself and became obedient to death on a cross you think about it, having done the greatest service, having done the greatest service, Jesus has been most highly exalted. Just like Elliot said earlier, we are here today to give glory and honor to Jesus because of his humble sacrifice. So looking back at the text, we see how Jesus contrasts the humility he calls us to with the pride of the Pharisees. See, the Pharisees, right, as we, as we read before, they love to be in a place of honor, like, look how great I am, go to all the fancy banquets, you know, most poor to seat in the synagogue, you know, sitting in their little golden chair, you know, so everybody can see them. They love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace. They love they loved being famous, right? Oh, look at me. Everybody knows me. I can barely, you know, sign an autograph or whatever they did back then. But Jesus warns against this kind of pride. He says, the greatest among you will be your servant. Whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. But in this world, there are people who, who say, and you probably heard this, you've got to look out for number one, right? Nobody's going to look out for you. You've got to look out for yourself. And it's easy to get wrapped up in that selfish pride, right? For most of us, it's our default mode. If you've ever had kids, or you got grandkids now and they're toddlers, they learn the definition of the word mine real quick, right? They know that word, and they'll like, mine, mine, mine. They just latch on to it. They know it. So we have to remember, to be humble is not a sign of weakness, but a sign of strength. It takes courage to be humble. It takes courage to go against the grain, right? It takes courage to admit our need for God. It takes courage to put others before ourselves. It takes courage to serve rather than be served. But when we do, we find that humility is not a burden, but it is a blessing. It frees us from the need to prove ourselves to compete with others, to strive for the approval of the world. And that allows us to rest in God's love and grace and to find our worth in him rather than in our achievements or our possessions. The power of humility, the power of humility opens the door for God to work in and through us. Proverbs 3.34 reminds us, he mocks proud mockers but gives grace to the humble. So when we humble ourselves, we position ourselves to receive God's grace and his unmerited favor. 
We make room for him to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is in work within us. Did anybody ever remember playing with this stuff as a kid? Right? Or maybe you got grandkids and you're, you play with them, you know. I, I think I may have given this to my, my grandniece one time just to make my niece very upset with me. Um, because you know, it gets all messy and in the carpets and everything. I'm, I'm good about giving gifts that would have made me very, very upset if my kid, you know, like microphones and stuff like that, you know, just, it's so great. But, <laughs> but you know, it would get, you get the smell on in your hands, you couldn't wash it off. And I never had this set here. I never had this, but I always thought it was cool. Anybody have this one? You had it, Leanne had it. It's like, I don't remember the commercial, you crank it out and all the little things would come out of their hair and you could cut it. It was like the barbershop thing. I just thought that thing was so cool. Never had it, but um, I always loved watching the commercial, right? If you haven't seen this thing in action, you should go watch an old commercial and see. It's kind of weird, like Medusa looking thing coming out of their head, you know? But it looked cool, right? But do you remember, if you ever play with it, remember leaving the container open. And then you go the next time, and it looks like this. And it's all sad, right? It's all dried out and crusty, you know, kind of like we get when we get older. You know, it's just kind of, <laughs> you know. <laughs> but it's just all sad, and you can't do anything with it. And just like you couldn't, I'm going somewhere with this, just like you could not use this dried out stuff, crusty old Play-Doh, just crank out those strands of Medusa hair. A prideful heart is a hardened heart, right? It's difficult for God to use a prideful heart. God wants to restore your heart so that he can transform it. But in order to do so, you must come to him humbly. So if we look at Jesus' teaching on humility, we see that they are profound. They're countercultural, especially in a world that often values self-promotion and personal achievement. His teaching on humility is a radical redefinition of greatness. In the kingdom of God, greatness is not measured by how many people serve you, but by how many people you serve. It's not about being first, but about putting others first. And this is a very challenging concept for us. But it's at the heart of Jesus' teaching on humility. Jesus himself embodied this humility. He is the king of kings, yet he washed his disciples' feet. He is the creator of the universe, yet he became a human and lived among us. He is sinless, and yet he took on the sins of the world. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8 says, In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. By becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross, even a humiliating death. So what does that mean for us? It means that as followers of Jesus, we are called to live lives marked by humility. This doesn't mean thinking less of ourselves, but rather thinking of ourselves less. It means putting the needs of others before our own. It means serving rather than being served. It means following the example of Jesus, though he was God, he humbled himself for our sake. British priest and theologian John Stott wrote, At the cross, in holy love, God through Christ paid the full penalty of our disobedience himself. He bore the judgment we deserve in order to bring us the forgiveness we do not deserve. On the cross, divine mercy and justice were equally expressed and eternally reconciled. God's holy love was satisfied. 
So this quote and underscores the ultimate act of humility. Jesus laying down his life for us. So what does living a life of humility look like? Well, first of all, living a life of humility begins with our understanding our position in relation to God. We are his creation, and we're dependent on his love, his grace, and his mercy. Recognizing this truth is the first step towards humility. It's about acknowledging that we are not the center of the universe, but rather we are part of this grand design that is orchestrated by the Creator. It's not about self-deprecation or thinking less of ourselves. Instead, it's thinking of ourselves less. It's about shifting our focus. We're supposed to shift our focus from ourselves and instead focusing on God and others. This shift in focus this allows us to serve others selflessly just, selflessly, just as Jesus did. Because he is our ultimate example of humility. Despite being God in human form, he chose to serve rather than be served. He washed the disciples' feet. He lived a life of simplicity, not seeking worldly riches or status. He chose to die a criminal's death on the cross, bearing our sins and shame. And we are called to emulate this humility. This means serving others without expecting anything in return. It means putting the needs of others before our own. It means being willing to take the lower place, to be overlooked, to be underappreciated. But it's also about this. It's also about being teachable. We need to be teachable. Humble people recognize that we don't have all the answers. One of the things I love um, when we have our Bible study we do it in a conversational kind of style. I learn so much from the other people in the room and what they have to say. You know, you get the shyest people. They speak out. It's like, whoa, that was profound. You know, so we learn from each other. So we're quick to listen. We're slow to speak, valuing the perspectives and experience of others. It's also about this. It's also about acknowledging your mistakes, right? And then asking for forgiveness, it's okay to say, man, I messed up. Will you, for, will you forgive me? That takes courage, right? So we need to be transparent about our weaknesses and failures. We can't grow if we don't. If we're, if we're all hiding them, how are we going to grow out of those weaknesses? You know, find somebody, find a godly person to share these things with. You know, find that relationship with someone. But this kind of honestly not only draws us closer to God, but it's going to foster these authentic relationships with other people. And the, it's also about trusting in God's plan and timing. Surrendering our desires and plans to him, confident that he knows, confident that he knows what's best for us. We need to trust in the Lord. We need to trust in God. It's like... You know, you buy a car, and, and you're like, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want to with this car. I'm going to put orange juice in the gas tank or whatever. It's like they designed this car to be a certain way. God knows you better than you know yourself. God knows your plans better than you know your plans. So we need to trust him and trust in his timing. It's, not, it's about being content with what we have rather than striving for more. But it's important to remember this last thing. It's important to remember that it is a lifelong journey. All right? Don't be so hard on yourself. You're going to mess up. What happens, when you, what happens when you fall down? You get back up. You knock the dust off, right? It's a constant process of dying to self and then living for Christ. It's about becoming less so that Jesus can become more. It's about decreasing so that he can increase. And it's about living in the light of his grace and glory rather than seeking our own. So humility, humility, it's not just a nice little virtue to have. It's a critical part of our Christian walk. A critical part of our Christian walk. It's about recognizing that we are not the center of our universe, but God is. It's about putting others before ourselves and serving them as Jesus served us. It's about acknowledging that every good thing we have comes from God 
and not from our own efforts or abilities. So as we go about our week, let's remember Jesus' words in Matthew 23. I challenge you to read them again this week. Not just this morning, but wake up tomorrow morning. Read them again. Pull out your Bible. Let's strive to be humble. Let's strive to serve others. And we have to strive to do it. It takes work. It goes against everything that we probably have been taught. You know, everything that we want to do, we have to strive to serve others and give the God the glory in all things. I will say this, though. A couple of weeks ago, we had the, the Carolina Care Movement come. And y'all's response, I don't know, it was incredible. Incredible. Uh, Pastor Matt has to, whenever it comes in, you, we kind of have to filter just to make sure we know the people that are signing up for it. He was having a hard time keeping up because y'all are just, just everybody signing up for that. So that was just great. And keep that up. Keep serving. And give God the glory in all these things. Remember, those who exalt themselves will be humbled. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. Let's all stand. Let's all stand. And let's keep these things in mind this week. Let's pray. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. We're grateful for your word this morning. God, remind us of these lessons this morning, God. Remind us uh, to stay humble, Lord. Remind us that we are, we are here to serve others just as you served us today, this morning. So we pray that you continue to give us a spirit of humility, God. We pray that we draw closer to you, and as we draw closer to you, we let the Holy Spirit, the fruits of the Spirit come out, God, and that humble spirit so that we can come to you humbly, Lord, and we can serve others in a humble way, God. We're just thankful for this time together this morning, Lord. Thankful for being able to come and worship and glorify your name this morning because it is all about you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.